Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC, hello and welcome, CC, hello and welcome, one, two, three, four, five, six, she sells seashells by the seashore, she sells seashells by the seashore, there we go, rolling. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 90. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Lately on the show, we've been reading some Doc Lifer emails and playing some messages from the TDL hotline. So far, this has seemed to have been a pretty popular move on our part as we've gotten a number of compliments about this sort of informal segment. And I've actually really enjoyed doing these. I've been able to meet some of you Doc Lifers directly and then share your stories with the rest of you. And hearing your stories firsthand, it not only has resonated with me, as I suspected, it's resonated with you guys as well. So when we return, I'm going to open today's show by sharing another recent correspondence that I've had with a listener of the program. It's an email that Steph and I have been talking about ever since it landed in our laps nearly three weeks ago from the time of recording of this episode. I cannot wait to share this one with you. Yes, sir. Now, you're not an adult till you're 18. Do you want me to be your daddy for the next eight years, son? Huh? Yes, sir. You do? <laughs> so as I mentioned before the break, this email came in about three weeks ago. And it's the kind of email that not only made my day, but in many ways, it reaffirmed what I'm doing right here with this podcast, as well as what I'm doing in my own doc life. It comes from a Patrick Suzuki Mitchell in L.A., though as you'll note as I read this, he's not a native Californian at all, having moved out from Virginia about seven years ago to work in the film and TV industry. Now, in the interest of time, I've taken the liberty to shorten the email a bit so that I may share it with you here on the air. And it reads, Hi, Chris. Let me start off by saying thank you so much for all the hard work you put into making your amazing podcast. I've been looking for a resource exactly like this for a long time now. After having stumbled upon your podcast, I felt this odd sense of relief. I am a first-time documentary filmmaker from Virginia, now living in Los Angeles. I've been working in the art department in film and television for the past six and a half years, designing, building, and dressing sets on numerous music videos, commercials, TV shows, and features, and I'm an IOTC Local 44 member. However, my real dream is to make a documentary about a strange story in which I have found myself entangled. Almost seven years ago, just two weeks before I was planning on driving across the country to attempt to start a career in the industry in L.A., despite not having any formal education nor experience, I was digitizing home movies when I came across a taped episode of The Jenny Jones Show, and for whatever reason, I continued to watch it. 
In the episode entitled Boot Camp My Preteen, a variety of different quote-unquote bad kids are sent before a drill sergeant type character who comes out on stage to berate the kids and force them to do things like push-ups, etc., which eventually culminates in the kids actually being sent to a boot camp for kids in North Carolina called About Face. As I watched, a young boy no older than 10 years old is confronted by the drill sergeant who comes out and says to the boy, You love that woman right there? You love her, right? Yes, sir? Now, you're not an adult till you're 18. Do you want me to be your daddy for the next eight years, son? Huh? Yes, sir. You do? <laughs> Why you want me to be your daddy? I have no daddy. You have no daddy? Well, let me tell you something. Come here, give me a hug. On a whim, I decided to digitize it and upload it to YouTube so that I could share it with my immediate family and friends, giving it the clickbait title, Saddest Boy Ever. I quickly forgot about it, and it sat online unwatched by me for the next three years. And then here, Patrick provides a link to the YouTube show, which of course I'll be putting in the show notes for this episode. To my shock, I discovered that in my YouTube absence, the video had gone viral. Today, it has over 20 million views on YouTube and over 11,000 comments. I was never notified of the popularity of the video because my YouTube account was created using my university email, which I'd lost access to after having graduated. Because no names were ever mentioned in the video, the internet became obsessed with finding the identity of the boy and drill sergeant and discovering what had become of the two. But because I am the sole owner of the original videotape, only I had their first names, and the internet detectives weren't able to identify or locate the boy. I have since been able to identify and locate not only the drill sergeant, but also the boy. My documentary will be about me meeting them individually, getting the truth about that day taping the episode, and hopefully bringing them together and reuniting them if appropriate. I have spent the last four years tracking down everyone involved in the story, making contact with them online and slowly cultivating relationships with them. Today I'm ready to abandon my career in the Hollywood entertainment industry system and embark on my journey making my first length documentary, which has honestly always been a dream of mine ever since I saw my first documentary, Crumb, on the IFC channel when I was 12. I want to close out this incredibly long-winded email by saying that in your earliest episodes, you seem to have a sort of spiritual vibe, talking about the magical nature of listening to your instincts, of answering the calling despite not having any experience, and only having a deep passion to tell a story and gut feeling that it is the right thing to do. Listening to you talk about destiny, fate, serendipity, coincidences, it resonated deeply with me, especially because on that night in December of 2011, I felt compelled by a force almost outside of myself to continue watching the tape and then upload it to YouTube. It is not something that I normally would have done, especially considering that it was late at night and I had a box full of VHS tapes to sift through. Even though the thought of pivoting at 32 years old to make my first documentary is something that it terrifies me to my core, I simultaneously feel like it must be done and has the potential to be the most important thing I've ever done in my life thus far. I feel as if this story has chosen me and won't leave me alone until it is told. Thanks again for all of your hard work, not only producing amazing content for the podcast, but for also cultivating a community through the Facebook page and group. I am extremely grateful. Keep up the good work. Sincerely, Patrick Suzuki Mitchell. Again, I actually did shorten that a bit, but the majority of the content and certainly the heart of it remains very much intact. And I wrote Patrick a couple of days after receiving his kind email, and we shared an email or two after that. But like I said, it's an email that has really stayed with me. I found his story not only to be potentially inspirational to other doc lifers, especially those who might be considering jumping into their first doc, but maybe have some hesitations about it, but it was also inspirational to me as well. I found some parallels with this pivot that he mentioned in his email and found myself taken with his overall story. I wanted to know more, and I wanted to thank him in person. And then perhaps hear a little more about his story. I wanted to start off by taking the time to thank you for calling me, but I also just wanted to thank you for 
for the podcast. Yeah, it's it's been great. I've been listening out out of chronological order, so it's been I'm trying to like keep the timeline straight and <laughs> but um <laughs> but it's so good. I I it's like I like I said in my email, I'm so grateful that I found it. It's it's like a it's exactly what I've been looking for. So thanks again for for all the hard work you put into producing it. Patrick, that means a lot to hear. I, I appreciate. And you know, this all started with the email that you that you sent us a, a couple of weeks ago, which I have just, yeah, uh, yeah. which I've actually just finished reading uh, for the show. And, um, and oh, so I'm, I'm glad that, you know, yeah, but I, I'm just really happy that we were able to connect and, um, and, and kind of share your story with, with other, with other listeners. Uh, you know, I, I would say, Welcome to the program, man, that you've been listening to and have been yeah, inspired by. It's 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 great to have you on the show. You know, what something I'd love to hear, Patrick, is what mm-hmm. was it, you know, what was it, and we're we're gonna be talking a bit about this actually on today's show of, about the idea of dreams and what propels you forward to 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 sort of pursue one's documentary dreams. What was it for you, Patrick, that truly made you in in your instance, leave Virginia to pursue these dreams in LA, and it may not have specifically been documentary at that mm-hmm. time. I know you went out, you work like like myself. Uh, you have an interesting background in that you you work in the film industry and that right. Um, right. commercial, whether it be commercially or or features. That's I know that you work and you've worked for a, for a while in the art department, and and yeah. this is what you know this is what pays the bills, if you will. It, it supports your doc life. So mm-hmm. if you could share with us what was is it if there was a moment that made you kind of impelled you to leave Virginia and head out to LA to pursue your dreams? I actually do have such a clear moment. Um, a little bit about my background is at, at the time I was 26, I was working for my dad in Virginia. He he owns a re- remodeling company. Or at the time he owned it, and uh, I was working for him after college, doing different graphic design and marketing and web design stuff for him. Um, but I really wasn't satisfied with my work. Mm. Um, and I, th- I think I was at a point in my life where I sort of realized that I had never seriously considered what it was that I wanted to be doing with my life as an adult. I would, you know, it, my early 20s, I was focused on finishing college, skateboarding, snowboarding, having fun with my friends. And then after that, I was like, well, you know, I'm not happy at this current job. And I, time's ticking. So, mm. I got an opportunity to to PA for free on a music video in DC. Mm-hmm. You know, I saw a friend had posted about this video in uh, on Facebook. I asked him if they needed any help. I had never worked on a production before, so I was actually terrified to go <laughs> to go out. But also, it's like one of those things where you're like excited, terrified, right? It's like right. where you're about to go out on stage or something. And I showed up and I had such a fun time, and I was like, man, this is. Like I want to do this for my job. I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is, but I want to be one of these people. You know, yeah. I want to be show up at this at 5 a.m. under a rainy bridge in D.C. and like you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, pull out the camera and start shooting. And it's just it was so fun. And I had a I had an epiphany. I was like, this is exactly the kind of job that I want to do. Yeah. And I, I didn't go to film school, but I just I really had been doing a lot of reading as well and just like some deep soul searching. Yeah. And I, I had heard this quote and it's like, why not me? If, if other people do it, you know, there are people in California or New York or wherever that are working and supporting themselves in the film industry. And, uh, you know, they didn't all go to film school. So I just sort of just wanted to say, fuck it and go to California and see what, you know, what I could make happen. Brilliant. You've you've been working in LA for about 7 years in the art department mm-hmm. in film and TV, designing, building, dressing sets. You've yep. done music videos, commercials, TV shows, features. You're in the local you're a local 44 member in IATSE. Uh you've been realizing this dream of film and TV. And yet there was something that's been nagging you and I and we'll hear perhaps for how long it's been nagging you and <laughs> to the point where you seem to be ready to make a big pivot in your life again at the age of 32 years old. <laughs> and you talked about being terrified that first day stepping on set as a PA. Yeah. What, yeah. if anything, terrifies you about this new pivot um, that you're going to tell us about? And uh, what's held you back, but what's propelled you forward? 
I think for me, my biggest fears are just that this idea that I have invested so much time. I've invested seven years doing this job, doing this career. Mm. And, and it takes it takes a while to to get to that point yeah. where you're steady, steady working on the kinds of projects that you want to be doing. That's right. And yet, like you said, I still feel this nagging. I feel I feel this pull to to pursue this. And it's like you talk a lot about. Uh, you know, sort of listening to your instincts, your intuition and, and this like confluence of dreams and magic. And like, I really, you bet. I, I really view life like that. Life is very magical as, so, as soon as you start, sort of start to look at it mm, like that. Mm, mm. And, and I've seen that reveal itself to me more and more as I get older. It's about being open to it. This is just something where I don't have any evidence to support this idea that I should do this thing. Yeah. Um, it seems silly, but at the same time, I'm I'm in a very similar situation as as the situation I was in seven years ago, where it was like I don't have any experience, <laughs> I don't know anybody, and I don't have a job. I'm gonna move to California and and work in the film industry. And it's like you know, my family they were all like, yeah, all, all right, good good luck. We uh, <laughs> that's we're, right. We're root we're rooting for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> we're behind you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I just I think I'm afraid of just losing what I have worked to to build and to have up to this point. But at the same time, I sort of realize that like there's this other thing that is way different from this lifestyle that I've built. And it's a lot more appealing in a lot of ways. You know, the the doc life. Yeah. And and I really want to see what that's about. And I, I watch tons of documentaries here in L.A. I go to a lot of screenings. Yeah. I talk to a lot of directors and it's just like. You have this realization, you're like, man, these are like the kinds of people. These people are cool. <laughs> like doc people are some pretty amazing people on this earth. They really are. Yeah. Well, they really are, and it's 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 a fun contrast to a lot of this like Hollywood <laughs> glitz and glamour that you see because uh, you interact with these doc makers like yourself, and they're so humble and they're brilliant. That's right. You know, and and they're they're so dedicated, and that is. The passion is so appealing. I mean, that's the thing that like really excites me is like having a passion about anything. But <laughs> but being yeah. being willing to sacrifice so much to to produce a documentary that has the potential to touch a lot of people is is so powerful. Well, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Uh, I love what you have said there, Patrick. You know, I mean, you have encapsulated in a few words. In many ways, um, a larger dialogue that we're having all the time on this show, and it's right. it's wonderful to hear it. You know, somebody like yourself, a listener, and somebody out there who is on the cusp is, of making their first doc film, um, kind of kind of say that back to us because that's at the heart of a lot of what we're doing here. And you know what, man? If you're looking for any evidence whatsoever. I can point to 20 million viewers on the YouTube video that you posted seven years <laughs> yeah. ago. If it's... you need any empirical data, it's right there. You've got somebody who wants to know the story, the story right. behind this. It's, it's beautiful. Right. I, I lose sight of that. Yeah. <laughs> I sort of like it. You look at it and you become a little numb to it, but yeah, that's, thank you for putting that in, per, into perspective for me because <laughs> right. it, I, I should not overlook that fact. Well, definitely not. Definitely not in that, you know, it's it's something that a, lot, that a lot of us doc filmmakers, you know, we would love to be, you know, to have that moment or have that position. And it's certainly something that it's one of the many things when you sent that email that that spoke to me and, and jumped right out. Um, oh, cool. It's great. It's great. One of the things that you mentioned the, in, also in the email, and, and we didn't have time to read it on, on, on the program or the segment, so I thought maybe mm -hmm. you could mention something about it, was you mentioned the idea or you mentioned a need for a mentor. Um, mm -hmm. And you also mentioned um, a dream mentor. So why don't you tell us, uh, tell us, uh, tell us about who your dream mentor might be? Well, th this will be funny. I mean, this is somebody that you have actually interviewed, but that I've been a fan of for a long, long time. It's Steve James. Um, he's, you know, he's from Virginia, so uh, we have that in common. And I just love his documentaries. I mean, Hoop Dreams is a masterpiece. And and Stevie, I, I, I watched Stevie, and as I was watching it, I was like, man, this is very, thematically, it's very similar to... I. I feel like it's similar to my the story that I'm trying to like uh, discover. Yeah. Um, and Steve James's ability to just to to really get people to a pl place where they're comfortable with being vulnerable, I think, is like 
you know, that's one of the core powers of documentary is just like th this idea of truth and and revealing like an emotional truth. That's right. You know, that that people don't see and that oftentimes we try and hide from other people. You know, this this idea of our fears and our weaknesses and mm. our shame mm. and all those things and his ability to to capture that is a superpower and just the empathy. You know, he just seems like a very empathetic person and approaches situations with sensitivity and i it's something that i hope that i can mimic beautiful it's it's definitely it's a uh it's something to aspire to that's that's for sure and as i'm mm -hmm. sure you're well aware of steve james is uh he has been an inspiration to so many of us doc filmmakers his name yeah. just comes up all the time doesn't it it's right. it's amazing it's amazing and it was it a really pleasure is. having him on i'm sure you've already listened to the show that we had him on uh, i have i think yeah. it was episode 62 incidentally he's coming back he's agreed to come back on the program in october to talk oh, about wow. his, his current doc series so so look Very for cool. that we've had other filmmakers on the show from car Quinn. we've had gordon quinn uh you know on the show himself and in many ways your film you know at the outset anything that you've described to me about this film it does seem like it could potentially uh fit that car Quinn a car Quinn mold so so who knows as you get as you get along in this journey on your doc <laughs> film um, man, Patrick, keep me aware of, 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 of how the film progress is going. Of course, and, uh, of course. I mean, who knows where this can go to? And, and certainly, um, there are some people over at Cartem when I might be able to put you in touch with, uh, at some point. So, um, so keep that in mind well, for sure. Yeah. Well, that would be incredible. I'm, I'm touched that you would even offer that, but yeah, th thank you. It's been, it's been really great talking to you, Chris. I just appreciate that that uh, that you found us here on the documentary life. Keep me aware of of developments with your film. It sounds like a fantastic story. Y yeah, of course, Chris. Thank you. I uh, I really enjoyed myself. Enjoyed talking to you. I want to take a moment to acknowledge one other Doc Lifer. His name is Christopher. And Christopher wrote to us last week to let me know that he was unable to find the Documentary Life podcast in iTunes or the Apple Podcasts app. Now, often this sort of thing is just kind of a fluky momentary instance. Unfortunately, this was not the case for us. We were suddenly, inexplicably unable to find our podcast within iTunes or the Apple Podcasts app ourselves. Now let's just say that the next 30 plus hours or so, while we worked things out with Apple, they were very anxious and nerve wracking to say the least. In any case, we've long since been back up, but we want to thank Christopher for taking a moment to let us know of this. Who knows how long we might have been down from iTunes until we discover that there was an issue. And by the way, wouldn't you hope that someone from Apple Podcasts would at least be kind enough to let you know of something like that? Now, if you'd like to write us here at TDL, maybe you've got a question or two for me or a topic suggestion or guess who you'd like us to have on the show, or maybe you're having some trouble finding our podcast like our friend Christopher, you can email me directly at chris at barongfilms.com and that's B-A-R-A-N-G films.com. And for those Doc Lifers whom a quick phone call might be easier, we now have the TDL hotline, and that number is 1-828-419-4845. All of this, of course, is a way in which we can all stay better connected to one another's doc lives. And there's, of course, another way to do this, and that's to jump into our free TDL Community Facebook group. If you haven't already done this, I do highly recommend it. It's a great way to share ideas, share projects, pick up some hot tips and recommendations for your doc filmmaking and doc living. And like I said, it's totally free. I'll put a link to the TDL Community Facebook group up in the show notes for this episode. Of course, you can also always search for it in Facebook book. When we continue with today's show, we're going to take a little more inspiration from Doc Life or Patrick, and we're going to talk about reasons why you should be making a Doc film. So if for some reason you've been hesitating in any way in making your Doc film, maybe you're battling with imposter syndrome or something like that, or if you're just feeling a bit stuck where you're currently at with your film, then I've got some encouraging words and some inspiration for you, my fellow Doc Lifer. And that is all coming up next here on The Documentary Life. Okay, hands up. Who here is living a documentary life? Would you say that you are? 
What does it mean to live a documentary life anyway? Well, we'll happily give you our definition. To us, living your documentary life means that you have crafted your lifestyle in a way such that you are able to make the documentary films you choose to make without it negatively impacting other aspects of your life, be that financial, your immediate relationships, or personal wellness. And furthermore, through the creation of your art, your existence is sustainable, creative, and fulfilling. Would you say this describes you? If not, is this something that you want for yourself? It was what we wanted for ourselves, and it took us quite a while to achieve it. Truthfully, there were many times we didn't think we'd make it at all. We were living in a world that was reactive rather than proactive, and it was costing us greatly. If any of this resonates with you, we'd like to help you find a better way. Because once we were able to honestly say we were living our documentary lives, we could look back and see what had gotten us there, and we knew we had to share it with others. We broke it all down and put it into Living Your Documentary Life, a program that helps you to craft your own lifestyle, relationships, and mindset in ways that empower you to make your best documentary films. You can find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash yourdoclife. Okay, so the way I'd like to approach this is to give you five reasons for making a documentary. Again, this can actually apply to more of you than those who are just now thinking of making a documentary, but for one reason or another are hesitant to do so. This can also apply to the vast majority of us who are already making a doc, but sometimes struggle with the day-to-day of our lives, or have moments where we're uninspired, or maybe even second-guess ourselves and our doc lives. And for those of you who this may apply to, myself included, let this serve as a nice reminder that we are, in fact, doing the right thing by making our doc films and following our documentary dreams. Cool. Now let's do this. Number one, it is your calling. Our doc lifer friend Patrick alluded to this one earlier. He knew deep down that there may have been something missing from his life. There was a calling that wouldn't go away for him to initially work in the film and TV industry, and then it was to make a documentary film. He shared that with all of us. And I think that you also know that feeling, that calling yourself, or else you wouldn't be here listening to me now on this show. I'm sure that there was a moment, and that moment could have been fairly recently, or it may have been a few years ago, but whatever it was that transpired in that moment, you were taken by an undeniable feeling that you needed to make a documentary film. I'll share one of my moments with you. It was when I was first in Cambodia back in 2004 when I'd been hired to work on the film Bomb Hunters. I'd been in country for about four weeks. We were filming testimonials of people who had lost a limb or three due to tampering with unexploded ordnance. And we were in a back alley in the city of Siem Reap. Siem Reap's where the famous Angkor Wat temp- temples are located. The day started off with a few people, but word quickly got around town and soon there was a whole line of amputees waiting to get in front of the camera and tell the story of how they'd lost a limb. It was then, listening to these people be incredibly vulnerable with us, telling their stories, and trusting that we would get their story out into the world, that's when I knew it. Deep, like all the way down that I wanted to make documentary films and perhaps be doing this for the rest of my life. I wanted to do it because I loved hearing people's stories. I loved crafting those stories, and I loved then sharing those stories with the world. So that's my moment. What's yours? And by the way, if you need to stop listening right now, go ahead, hit the pause button. Go write that damn moment down right now so that you can reflect on it daily or for whenever you might need a quick reminder. Seriously, go and do that. We'll be here. We're not going anywhere, Doc Lifer. Number two, everyone loves Docs. Okay, maybe not everyone, but certainly the rise in popularity of the documentary film has long been well-established and... Um, documented. 
All one has to do is a cursory search of Amazon, Netflix, or Hulu, or YouTube, or Vimeo even for that matter, and you'll just see how many docs are out there. HBO docs has been a thing for longer than these guys. And just look at the proliferation of documentaries that you can find in the theaters now. I mean, until Hoop Dreams back in 94, I'm not even sure I knew you could watch a documentary on the big screen. People love documentaries, and we could easily do a whole show on the whys and hows of its popularity. But suffice to say, the documentary film is here to stay, and its popularity and its visibility is probably only going to increase. Of course, I'm not here preaching the gospel of the popularity of documentary as a reason in itself to be making a doc film. I'm not saying, oh, hey, check out this really cool thing over here that people love watching and, and therefore you should be making something for them to watch. If anything, I'm merely noting that, hey, this is a great time to be a doc filmmaker because doc films are very much in the collective consciousness. People have never been more open to doc films or had the access to them than they have today. And again, that's only going to increase. Number three, because you are the person to tell the story. I fully believe that we don't so much come to our doc projects as much as they come to us. Using our friend Patrick again as an example, his idea for his doc film kind of came to him, right? One day, seven years after posting a fairly innocent old TV clip up on YouTube, he happens to take a look at the clip only to discover that 20 million people have also viewed his clip. The clip had gone viral, and it clearly touched a nerve with a whole heck of a lot of people. And the more that he looked at the thousands of comments, the more he himself wanted to know more about the story behind the people in the TV clip. The story wouldn't go away for him. He had to do something about it. Now, We'd all be so lucky to have something like this happen for us, right? But I'm here to tell you, you most certainly don't need 20 million affirmations that you are the right person to tell a particular story. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, you only initially need one affirmation. And that should come from you, or maybe more appropriately, from within you. There is a story that you know that needs to be told. In your heart, Something tells you every day that this is a good story, that you want to make a doc film about it. And initially, that is all that you need. That's plenty good enough. Sure, eventually you're going to need to enlist the help of probably a great number of people along, along the way who are going to help you tell this story and to get the story out into the world at some point. And these are the people that you're certainly going to enlist from time to time. But at the end of the day, it's going to have to come from you, from within. From time to time, you're going to need to return to your inner core, return to your heart and your belief in this story that you want to tell. It is you that ultimately is going to be the one make, that makes this film happen. It is you that is the person who is best suited to tell this particular story. Otherwise, it's my belief that this story would not have found its way to you. Number four. You already have the equipment. It's called your phone, which is also kind of called a camera. Now, I understand that this may not be all of you. Not everyone has a smartphone, right? But there's certainly a great number of you who do own a smartphone. And if you're only using it to check your email, how many Instagram likes you're, going, you're getting, or to make phone calls, and you're currently not working on your doc, well then let this serve as your official kick in the pants because you cannot use the I don't have the equipment excuse any longer, not when you have a smartphone. You could get out there today, right now even, and get shooting on your dock. And by the way, if you do want to do that, I won't hold it against you. Like I said, we'll be here for when you come back after your shoot. A great number of people are shooting films on their phones. Some of them you're seeing in the theater, and most certainly you're seeing them on streaming platforms like Amazon or Netflix. We've dedicated specific shows to the craft of mobile filmmaking. Remember when we had on Filmic Pro founder Neil Barham, or former BBC journalist turned mobile journalist, Anna Breeze on shows earlier in the summer? Those shows and a lot of what I'd been reading about mobile filmmaking were what moved me to try my hand at shooting with my phone. In fact, if you want some nice reading material, London Doc Lifer Damien Swaby, he recently made the switch completely over to mobile filmmaking. He wrote a guest blog for us actually about it entitled Making the Switch to Mobile Filmmaking. I'll post a direct link to it in the show notes. 
Anyhow, if equipment is in any way, shape, or form what's holding you back from making your dock, well then either get out there now and start shooting with your phone, or sit down and have a hard conversation with yourself about why you're really not making your dock film. Which leads me to number five. You are a dock filmmaker, so stop questioning it. This one applies to those of you who are sitting there and listening to this, and still something is holding you back, but you can't quite put a finger on it. You know that you want to make a doc. We've already established that you probably have a camera, like in your pocket right now. You have a great idea for a doc, and maybe even know the people whom you could film. So what's keeping you from it? I'll bet that it's you. Well, maybe not even you, but a part of you. The part of you that lets your fears sometimes get in the way of your dreams. The part of you that tells you that you can't or shouldn't do something. That silly things like making documentary films, that's for doc filmmakers, and you're most certainly not one of those. You just, well, you just really, really, really want to be a doc filmmaker who has this really, really great idea for a doc that you've had for a really, really long time, but somehow have managed to convince yourself that you're really, really not equipped to be a doc filmmaker. Again, other people do that sort of thing, right? Not you. Oh man, oh man. If you're telling yourself that right now, or have ever told yourself that in the past, well, let me tell you this. Do you know how many times I wondered if I was cut out to be a doc filmmaker? If I could really go to Nepal and not only shoot goats and herders trekking in the Himalayan mountains and then somehow come back home and edit this thing together, you know, edit together a comprehensible story? Uh, let's just say a lot of times. Or how many doc filmmakers I've met in my life who are absolutely petrified to make their film because they constantly questioned whether or not they were a doc filmmaker? Uh, let's just say a lot. So I think it's high time to stop telling yourself that you're not a doc filmmaker or that you're not fit to make a doc film. Because you are a doc lifer. You are just as fit as any person that I know out there who is either slinging around a $20,000 camera or using their iPhone as a camera. We're all telling stories. We're all storytellers. And you have a story inside of you. So why not get to telling it? I think I'd like to finish off today's episode with a quote from fellow doc lifer Ian McCluskey, who we had on the program many eons ago when this show was actually in its infancy. A time, by the way, when I was still questioning whether or not I was someone who should be hosting a show about documentary filmmaking, or if there were people out there who even wanted to listen to this kind of a show. It's something that Ian said way back in episode number 9, and it has stayed with me ever since then. It's one of the most meaningful things any doc filmmaker on this program has ever said, and I think we should end today's show with it. This one's for you, my doc filmmaking brothers and sisters. We'll see you next week, and I greatly look forward to it. People who are called to documentary, take heart, you know, take it seriously. Because few are, few are called, and it's not very sustainable to most, but those who are called, it is a, it's an important journey, and it's an important thing to do with one's life. Don't forget, if you're looking to live and lead a documentary life, you need to head over to thedocumentarylife.com slash yourdoclife and take a look at our Living Your Documentary Life program. We'll help you craft your lifestyle so that you are able to make the documentary films that you want to make and live the doc life you want to live. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.